Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Vision radio show. Today is November 30th, and uh, this is Monday, and normally you are anticipating that I'm going to be reading the nuclear alerts or alerting you to nuclear meetings. Um, I announced this on the radio last Friday. I've kind of had an epiphany. There is a catastrophe going on in our own country uh, I liken it to Fukushima. There is a disaster happening in St. Louis that is being uh, summarily ignored. So since I have the venue of this radio show, I have decided I am dedicating every single Monday to this uh, catastrophe in St. Louis. I am hoping that every Monday I'll be able to have uh, someone from that community they're all just citizen, journal, citizen journalists or just moms and dads and people out there. Uh, and they can bring us information of what's really happening on the ground. I, the goal of this is to pressure our elected officials to take this catastrophe seriously and treat it like the true disaster that it is. Um, on the line I have uh, a mom who basically started a Facebook page and she's now kind of become the voice for this Facebook page. Her name is Dawn Chapman. She's with the Westlake Landfill Facebook page. Uh, they have actually started a really awesome little website called stlradwastelegacy.com. And Dawn, I want to introduce you. Thank you for joining us here on the radio this morning. Thank you for having me, Lonnie. Yes, I really, um, I really want to impress upon people that you are not like uh, a professional anti-nuke activist, right? You're just a mother. Right. And um, why don't you inform our listeners of what the catastrophe is that is going on in St. Louis? So we have a landfill that is actually a super fun site. So it's one of those old, unregulated landfills where you could dump anything in it, um, anything, chemicals. And, you know, St. Louis is a very industrial city and was at one time and, and still is to some extent. And so a lot of those companies, when, and we have this because we have the permits for it, um, dumped their industrial waste in this unlined landfill in the floodplain of the Missouri River. And so not only does it have that, but in two portions that we know of and to what extent we're still trying to find out after 40 years, we have radioactive waste that was dumped in this landfill. Only when it was dumped, it was presented as clean fill dirt, so it is kind wow. of mixed in a little bit. And it's on the surface in many areas. And now about um, 2010, an underground fire started in the Superfront site, burning in the landfill. And unfortunately, because, of it, it, because it's two quarries with the middle blasted out, that fire has continued to burn now for five years. Wow. will continue to burn for probably the next five plus to almost a decade. These fires, there's no known way of putting them out and is slowly but surely advancing towards the nuclear, the known areas of nuclear waste. Known areas. Now, that doesn't include, I mean, St. Louis has been flooded in the last 30, 40 years, haven't they, several times? We have, and we are very fortunate that our levee in Earth City did not break during the last major flood. But should it, ble should it break, it, it is absolutely in the floodplain, and obviously, with groundwater, unfortunately, you don't have to have levees break to have flooding because as the river rises, so does the groundwater. Right now in this landfill, some of this radioactive um, nuclear weapons waste, really the first nuclear weapons waste ever created in the world from the 1940s, the Manhattan Project, is sitting in the groundwater. So, you know, it's it's... You mean, what do you mean it's sitting in the groundwater? It's not sitting, it's in the groundwater, right? Okay. Well, the groundwater is showing signs absolutely of contamination, but the reason is is because the groundwater table is so high. I mean, this is a floodplain. Uh. So when they buried this waste and when they, you know, they used it to cover garbage and whatnot, those areas, many of them are constantly underwater from the groundwater. So... So this is an unlined landfill. It's literally sitting in the groundwater, and obviously the water rises and lowers with the river level, but the wells around the site are absolutely 
you know, showing up positive for levels of radioactivity. So there is a fire that's headed towards the radioactive waste. And yes. what, what do they think will happen when it reaches the radioactive waste? Well, I mean, there are many different opinions. Unfortunately, um, you know, this, this is, again, this is material that was processed during World War II, and it was processed incredibly small. These particles are very, very small, smaller than you would expect um, because this was the dawn, you know, from the dawn of the atomic age. They are thinking that should the two meet, first of all, there won't be a mushroom cloud or an explosion, not on its own. I mean, obviously, you could have a pocket of methane or something that might, but that with the emissions and smoke, you could very much have particles that are released into the air, or worse, is that they meet underground, and there is like a liner on top of this landfill that... Um, it's hard to explain. It's like a big plastic bag on top of the landfill right now, mm-hmm. and it catches these emissions, and it sucks them through a flare system. That is, that system would backfire should the fire hit the waste, because what would happen is, you know, this is mixed in with other garbage. So, you know, you have gloves, diapers, whatnot, which are also now contaminated with radioactive particles. If that fire hits them and burns them, then the particles underground would be released and the suction that's used to capture the gases and emissions would capture all that, would pull it through the flare system. We all know that fire does not destroy radioactive waste. So what it would do is it would send these particles out of the flare and into the surrounding community. I mean, this really is, it is a very unique situation. It's a very complicated and it is a very scary situation for this entire region. What is the proposed plan to remediate it and to stop it? What is, what is the, I guess, the NRC or who is managing this and what is their plan? Well, this is unfortunately a Superfund site. So you have EPA basically babysitting the site under Superfund and trying to find a final remedy. They wanted to leave it where it was and put a little bit of earth on top of it, leave it sitting in the groundwater. It was a decision that was made in 2008, and that was abandoned because of the community, you know, was, 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 was not happy with that, but also because the National Remedy and Review Board from EPA, their own, their own review board came back in and said, guys, you didn't look at all the options. You know, go wow. back and revisit, and you didn't do enough groundwater surveys and enough studies to determine that. But... To answer your question about what to do about the fire and approaching the radioactive waste, what they want to do is they want to build some sort of fire break. They're calling it a barrier. Um, remember, this is in a landfill. It's in a dump. It's in a Superfund site. So they, they want to maybe use inert gas, maybe freeze the ground. There's a lot of different things. The problem is that, first of all, they have to find an area that doesn't have radioactive waste. Because obviously it does you no good to build a barrier and have radioactive waste be on the other side. I mean, the whole point is to keep the two from meeting. Right. And to date, to date, they still haven't found their clean line. We're waiting any day for them to announce, okay, we finally found it. And Are they you know, looking that, for it? Are they, are they really literally, are, is the EPA or the NRC, is anybody actually looking to locate where is the, where, where's the level of, of radiation and where it's at, where... Where it's at in these, this, I mean, I, I envision it like some big gigantic mound, right? Is that what it is? Well, it's, it's, it's even bigger than that. I mean, I mean, this is acres and acres of area where this is sitting on the surface and some of it buried under the ground. Right how, now, how they, many they acres? Keep, Let me jump in here. How big is it? How large of an area? Like, what are we talking about? Well, the whole area is about 22 acres. This, the, the areas where, where the contamination are, make up a small portion, no, I shouldn't say small, really I guess it totals a little bit less than maybe one-third of the entire landfill. But the problem is, again, is that that really could be bigger because, unfortunately, they didn't do the correct studies that they needed to do in order to find the extent of contamination at the site. You know, we basically, we're back to square one at this site. What kind of radioactivity is it? They're doing, they're doing a chemical and radiological analysis and characterization of the waste. 
EPA is ordering this to be done. Now, remember, this has been a Superfund site for 20 years, and EPA is just now, and the fire's been burning for five. EPA is just now getting around to doing that, which is, in our opinion, as a mom, that's an epic fail. But, you know, they're, they're literally digging holes in the ground, basically sending down a Geiger counter and taking samples out, trying to trying and hoping and praying and really just crossing their fingers that they're going to dig in an area and it's going to come up with no radioactivity. Again, the problem wow. is that it's been there for 40, it's been there for over 42 years now. So this waste has had plenty of time to move around in the landfill and get washed. And, and I think, you know, that is why politically this is such a, no pun intended, hot issue because it is so complicated and complex, and you do have this fire that is, that is, you know, creeping towards it. It's kind of literally like a ticking time bomb, if you think about it, or a slow-moving tornado. You're not, to, to find a break, to find a way to, to keep the two from meeting, I mean, I mean that, is a, that is an incredible feat of engineering that they're going to have to come up with. And then they're going to have to have a way to implement it quickly. And we're being told right now that the quickest they could build such a break or fire trench or whatever they build, that it wouldn't be completed for like 18 months. Wow. Well, look, let me just jump in here because I really believe that we need to stop using the language of this is a political issue. This is not a political issue. This is a health issue. This right. is a problem for every family living I would say within 10 miles of this dump site, at least 10 miles. I mean, it, from what you're telling me, um, well, let me just move on through this and ask you some questions about the medical impacts to these families. Are the fam I mean, I suppose the government's position is, don't worry, there's no real danger to human health. That's their standard. We haven't observed any negative effects, and we all know that's because they're not looking. But what are the real effects? What are the, how are the families near this dump site? How have, do you know how they have been impacted? Is anybody, are, are very few people sick, or do most families have major problems? Well, and you know, that is something that even right now on the page people are upset about and debating. I mean, we have many health problems here many health problems here. We have an increase in brain tumors, and unfortunately, one of the tactics that we're seeing is that, you know, both the agencies and the responsible parties right now for Westlake Landfill are trying to divide issues among St. Louis. We have, although Westlake right now is the most critical because of not only its, its complexity, but the fact that it has the ability to basically move this stuff off-site in a way that, you know, could affect so many people in this area. Um, radioactive waste is not new to St. Louis. We have radioactive waste issues just a mere miles from this site, really three miles from this site. Um, you know, this, this material was stored so haphazardly here in our city because of the Manhattan Project that, you know, it, it's, there are other sites that are contaminated. There are parks, backyards, you name it. And, wow. you know, what that does for us is they're trying to say, well, that's that area and people are sick from that, but they're not sick from Westlake. Um, you know, I think that wow. you know, and that's a strategy I think that the industry would like to latch well, on to as well. Look, the issue is really radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project. It Absolutely. doesn't matter where it's sitting. It's the fact that there, we know for a fact radioactive waste causes catastrophic harm to children and to women and to, you know, babies in utero. And, you know, the government has a responsibility and an obligation to help remediate. Like, there's families living within five miles, I think, living within five miles of the dump site their houses need to be purchased, and we need to move them, and we need to help accommodate them and put them in a place where their families can be safe. Is that conversation even going on, say, with any of your senator's office? Oh, it is, absolutely. That is, you know, obviously we would like an ultimate solution to Westlake, and we'd like them to make sure the fire doesn't hit the waste. But the dilly-dallying that's going on with that and 
the, the broken bureaucracy that is Westlake Landfill and really the Manhattan Project in St. Louis, from our standpoint, we're like, okay, you know what, fine. Then put the people first and get the people that are the closest out of the way and then gain yourself some more time to do what, what you feel you need to right. do. Right, right. Because, I, you know. You're right. This is not going to be fixed in a heartbeat, which is why these families need to be moved immediately. Right, and they've already been enduring it for five years. I mean, which is really more than you can ask of anybody. And to put an yes. to put an unlimited, undefined amount of time on how long this fire will continue to burn for is unfair. I mean, these people have given up five years now. I mean, to say, well, you may have to give up another five, maybe another ten, maybe maybe fifteen. I mean, to these people, you cannot ask that of them. And really. You know, we, we're talking about one fire right now at this site. This site has a history of these fires. This is the third fire that we know of, possibly wow. the fourth at this site. These landfill fires do start. And the problem is that although this fire is enormous, it's the size of six football fields, it's about 250 feet deep. What? Say the that ground. again. The fire? Yeah, the fire now is about the width of six football fields. And you're looking at, um, because it's an old quarry, I mean, this is, this is 250 feet deep in the ground. Obviously, it's mounded on top, too, but it's, it's like an iceberg. It's deeper underground than it is on top. I mean, this is a massive, massive underground fire. And because of the groundwater, it's creating like a crock pot in that area. I mean, it's just simmering and smoldering and, smoldering and there's all this liquid and, you know, these emissions coming off, this, because of the entire scenario, you have people living within half a mile of it. You have people wow. living practically on top of this site. And, you know, these things, these fires start. You have one that's in the southern area right now. This time, this time exactly last year, we watched another one try and start closer to the radioactive waste. There was a one, two-month period there where the attorney general, who is suing the owner of the landfill and is fighting on behalf of the community right now, took them to court for more data because there was a hot spot. It looked like a, a fire was starting underground a mere couple hundred feet from the known location of radioactive waste. Oh, wow. So even if you built a barrier in this landfill and you separate this fire from the radioactive waste, you can never you, you you can never guarantee that there won't be another fire that starts in the area that contains the radioactive waste. So let I mean, me is, let, let me ask you this. Let's talk about this dump site. It's called the Westlake Landfill. Who does the government own it? No. Um, however, the government is halfway responsible for it. Um, it's owned by a company named Republic Services. Who Bill is Gates is. Do you know who, yeah, let's talk about the people who are decision makers with Republic Services. Who are those people? Who are the well, people? Well, really, I mean, the, the main decision maker, the majority shareholder of Republic Services is Bill Gates. You're kidding. Mr. No. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. He owns this... over 30% of the stock through Cascade Investments, which is his investing company in Republic Service. He is the major, major shareholder. It was for a while that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also owned SOC. We learned back in June that they actually sold that stock. They actually canceled out of it and sold all their stock off. But then the next month, Cascade Investments came in and bought up those shares. Yeah. So it was really tricky, you know, that... So he took his of, foundation out of it. So this guy is, this is how evil. I mean, honestly, we need, this is what I'm saying. Like, we need to actually start a petition to Bill Gates to, like, make better decisions. This is, this should be an urgent matter to move those people out. Now, is Republic Services willing to move people out and buy people's homes out? Well, and, you know, they, they're refusing to, and they're telling the senators. Then they, They've actually... Believe it or not, I mean, the, the gall that this company has is pretty astounding. You know, they've told the senators that they will not agree to buy these people out because they have other landfill fires, many of them burning right now across the nation, and it would set a precedent for those other sites. 
And obviously my response is, okay, you have other landfill fires. You don't have other super fun sites. And I bet they don't have the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste sitting in them. This site is much different and much more complicated than any other site that they own. And so, you know, obviously it deserves a different type of attention. And, you know, that's our argument. But, you know, it's, it's very, very frustrating. And, you know, the whole Bill Gates connection, in all honesty, um, it, it is very frustrating because of the philanthropy and we're we're asking, you know, philanthropy. Asking, that's not exactly philanthropy. No, I mean, there's a special be, word for it when you have a philanthropist who also makes money off of things like this. I mean, there's a lot of really horrible things that this company is doing to this community. That I mean, I would love the opportunity to sit in front of Mr. Gates and say, "Let me show you." I mean, they sometimes they they've picketed our community meetings. With what? They, they, they what? have founded a fake coalition. It's called the Coalition to Keep Us Safe. I shouldn't repeat that on air. You know, never repeat your enemy's <laughs> phrases. But they have started this fake coalition, and it's a lobby group. It's fully funded by them. They make calls. They've got commercials out. Their thing is that we are a bunch of liberal activists who are fear-mongering. Wow. And that... We the way should be kept where it is because it's too dangerous to clean it up and put it on trains. That's too dangerous. And, I mean, the list goes on and on with their okay, saying. Okay, even if they want to say that, that's fine. What about moving out the, uh, I don't know, how many families are living within five miles, ten miles, the 150,000, right. 100,000 people? Like, the Bill Gates Foundation could move all those people out tomorrow and hand everybody a check for $200,000 or whatever the value of your house is, and not even be hurt financially. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I mean, his dividends, his dividends every quarter that he gets off of this site, I mean, they're incredible. I mean, he could, he could more than afford it. Again, it's... So it's wait a very, minute, I'm going to back up, because I, I have to admit, I'm sort of a financial idiot. I don't really understand. You're telling me that it, the Republic Services... It's a public company, and the, he makes it. It's this company is making what? It's trading on the stock market and making big money. He's living off of dividends from it. Oh yeah, they are. They are. They are several. I, I think I want to say it's six to nine billion a year. This is the second largest waste company in the world that we're talking about here. We we, and I and I think that for the listeners. It explains, again, going back to the complexity of this, the complexity of this site, I mean, obviously, for science reasons, is a mess. It's unusual. But let's get into the, let's get into the corporations that are responsible for Westlake. You have Republic Services. You also have Exelon, owners of Three Mile Island. The big nuclear industry, Exelon, is responsible at this site. And you also have the Department of Energy, because the Department of Energy in the 1940s contracted with Mallinckrodt to process this uranium. So the three responsible parties, again, at Westlake are Republic Services, Exelon, which, you know, General Atomics, and the Department of Energy. The and Federal what Government. is Exelon responsible for? Exelon bought this material when it sat out at the airport. They bought it from the federal government. Now, to be fair, to be fair, the federal government should never have li – Exelon did not have a license for source material. And yet the federal government classified this material as something else in order to be able to put it up for bid because they didn't want to bear the cost – of moving it and who um, did that? Now who did that? Was that did that generate from Congress, the Department of Energy, or who? Whose brilliant idea was that? Do we know? The AEC, the AEC, uh, and the, the NRC. Yeah, and then the it was the NRC, but yeah, AEC. That was a license. The license wow. that and it was Cotter Corporation. Cotter, Cotter, it was Continental Mining first, and it was Cotter Corporation then, which then obviously is a spin-off of Exelon. But Cotter bought the material, and once they bought the material, and honest to God, I've got the actual letters, they, when 
they bought it and then they started, then they realized all of a sudden when they came out to look at it, they're like, oh my God, what did we buy? Because they realized that there was other stuff there than what was listed on the bid. So they started sending this stuff off to Oak Ridge in different places to be tested. And I mean, they actually wrote a letter back to the Department of Energy and the AEC saying, guys, uh, the stuff that you had sitting out that we bid on, we just had it looked at, and uh, there's more there, and this is not what we thought it was. Can we, you know, you basically you tricked us. Can you, can you come and get this, or can we, can we bring it to you to put in one of your quarries, which they had a quarry in St. Louis out at Weldon Spring, DOE did, where they were putting stuff, and the response was no. You bought it. It's yours. You're then, kidding. No, several months later, they came back and did the same thing. They said, and this time they were begging. They're like, guys, please, we bought this material for $150,000, and you sold us material, and you were not upfront and honest. We had this looked at, and they even say, it's going to cost us over $2 million to send this to a licensed facility. We don't have that money. We don't have it. This, you know, you're the AEC. You you have places where you put your own stuff. This is partially your fault. This is your material. Please either come and take it or we'll bring it to you. Yeah. And the response back was no, absolutely not. Buyer beware. You bought it. I mean, this is your federal government wow. having this conversation. You, are those copies of that, is that copy of that letter available publicly? Oh, yeah. I can email this to you. I, I was just, love that because you know what, like, this, this to me, that letter alone is, we ought to be the justification for Claire McCaskill, Roy Blunt, and Governor Jay Nixon to demand the federal government remediate this because they were not, you know, the, it's one thing to say that the people who bought it, uh, what was it called, the Cotton Corporation, Cotter yeah, Corporation, Cotter Corporation, they knew that they were buying something. Right, but they were not even informed that they had bought radioactive waste, and then when they found out they had, the government's like, eh, "Sorry, it's not our problem anymore." Like that is that's an uh, any any eighth grader could understand that that's an unconscionable act. I mean, well, it is, and they asked, and you know, obviously, what happened after that is, like Cotter said, they didn't have the money to dispose of it properly, so yeah, they illegally dumped the majority oh. of it at West Lake Land so. I mean, that's oh. what happened. And then they lied, and they said, oh, it's just clean fill dirt, which is gold to a landfill owner. So, you know, were they wrong? They were wrong because, obviously, they illegally dumped it, and now it's been at a landfill for 42 years. I mean, this was in 1973. So Cotter illegally dumped. dumped it in the landfill. But, frankly, the problem started with the federal government, with the Absolutely. Atomic Energy Commission, refusing to be honorable human beings and manage this waste, and they dumped it off on somebody who couldn't handle it. It's like handing an eighth grader a machine gun and telling them, uh, watch out for uh, intruders. You know what I mean? It's, uh, that's, right. That's an insane, that's well, an insane it, proposition. It gets, it gets even better. It gets even better. Because once it was illegally dumped at Westlake, DOE realized it, and obviously Cotter was liable, but so was the DOE. They tried to get out of it. That is why they moved it to Superfund. They moved it to Superfund, and, and honest to goodness, I have this letter. I, I, we FOIA'd the DOE for this letter, and it says, it is in the best interest of the DOE not to be the sole responsible financial party at Westlake Landfill, and we urge DOE to block any legislation that would basically make them the ones that were responsible to write the check. And then it says it is, you know, it is better to put it under Superfund. And they say because under Superfund there are other responsible parties. Basically, under Superfund, the Department of Energy knew that they could split the check. And I have wow. this document that says this. And this is the key. This is one of the reasons why we did get this legislation written you know, obviously we still have to get it passed, but that is one of the reasons because we have this paper trail from the Department of Energy. When it was moved to Superfund, so EPA came in and said, okay, we're going to stamp it Superfund, it's Superfund, here's the responsible parties. The responsible parties listed were Cotter 
and the owner of the landfill at the time, DOE tried to walk away, and both of those responsible parties and EPA were like, uh, no, what are you doing? Get back here. The Department of Energy refused, and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, had to actually call in the Department of Justice. Oh, my the gosh. Dep- honest to God, the Department of Justice came in, looked at Westlake, looked at the letters that I was just describing, and then looked back at DOE and said, uh-uh, get back in here. Get back in here. This is your material. You lied, and you put it up for bid, and you knew you lied to this company. You are still responsible for it, therefore. So, so, so in case the listeners think I'm making this up, and this is my interpretation, it's the Department of Justice's interpretation as well. That is why, to date, right now as we speak, the Department of Energy, the federal government, is actually responsible up to 50% for what is spent to clean up the radioactive waste at Westlake Landfill. So we can talk about gates and everything else, but the federal government has the ability right now to move those people as well. Yes. And they ought to. Uh, actually, yeah, that, that actually should be happening right now. Those houses should be being bought out and people should be moving immediately. Like you know, that, the one thing we're asking, we're not asking for a lot. We're, you know, we could be asking for more, and we know that. But to be more reasonable, we're asking for one mile within the site. Obviously, five miles I don't think would be too much to ask, but we're ten starting miles. with a mile. I mean, if you guys have you looked into any, I mean, if anybody who knows anything about radioactive waste Frankly, the circle is a minimum of 25 miles, minimum. And the problem with that is that only five miles away you have Coldwater Creek, which is contaminated in parks. So when you start talking about you're infringing upon that area, I mean, if you were to, if you were to draw a 5, 10, 20-mile radius around these sites that are contaminated in St. Louis, it would be just about all of St. Louis. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, because we wow. have a downtown Mallinckrodt site, we have an airport site, then we have another site by the airport. We have a creek that's eight miles long that's flooded and dispersed the material into people's backyards. We have a site out in St. Charles, Weldon Spring, which, you know, we've got a hematite. I mean, we have these sites all around St. Louis. There is a legacy here from the Manhattan Project. Wow. And if you, were to draw, if you were to draw 20 miles around those sites, You'd be talking about the entire St. Louis area. And that right there, if it were just Westlake, I believe that we could get those people moved and we'd have a solution. The problem is is that, again, to call a spade a spade at Westlake, then you have to acknowledge that it's bad in Coldwater Creek, again, where it's in the creek and it's in people's backyards and in parks. You'd have to say it's bad at the downtown site, which had stacks where they would try and burn this stuff before Again, dawn of the atomic age, before they knew you couldn't destroy radioactivity with fire, they tried to burn stuff at Mallinckrodt to get rid of of this waste. And it went out the stacks and went who knows where over downtown St. Louis. I mean, this stuff, the legacy left over... That speaks to why we have a zero. This is... That really speaks to why the go- the our government is resistant to really being honest brokers in this because how many people live in St. Louis that you think should be evacuated? Like if you, I mean, a twenty mile radius, how many people is that from that? I can't even calculate. I mean, you, you, this is this is not a country area. I mean, this is very yeah. much an urban area with houses close to each other, with schools, with an international airport. I mean, uh, you. It, it's it's insanity. It's like they really want to pretend like radiation does not harm anybody at all. That's the issue here. That's the insanity. Is the emperor has no clothes. That's what we're talking right. about. Well, and the other thing, too, is that in such a small area, I mean, St. Louis, I mean, even though it's a big area, we're all so close together. You know, it, it's not, it, it's easier than it would be in a rural area to track these cancers and then social media, you know, you can look at streets and you can look at zip codes and you can say something weird's going on here, guys. This isn't normal. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the pieces are just now starting to fall into place from this. For instance, places in North County and to some extent in areas around Westlake, you know, there are little pockets of areas where there are these foreclosures and these bankruptcies. And, you know, we were, we were sitting back 
talking to the health department one day about it, and I, you know, it just dawned on all of us. We were like, how many of those are medical bankruptcies? You know, cancer will will, yeah. will absolutely bankrupt you. Or people with severe autoimmune illnesses with all these prescriptions that they're paying a month, how many of those bankruptcies are medical-related? And then, you know, it's like the light bulb went off in everybody's head. You know, it's 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 a very... I, I don't know what else to say other than it's, it's... It's a very difficult situation here in St. Louis, and... I think you mentioned when we had talked before that there are other sites. There's Hanford, Rocky Flats. You know, there are other sites across this nation where this waste has gotten out into communities, and it is it has harmed people and made them sick. But a lot, you know, we started it here in St. Louis. This was this is where the first uranium used in the bombs. You know, was my my feeling of top secret. My feeling about this is that, honestly, this is why I like I wanted to use my venue here on Mondays to make this front and center because, in my view, St. Louis deserves... I, I read the legislation that has the cookie-cutter language indemnifying no liability. I mean, this is the infuriating part. In the legislation that's being proposed to be passed to help remediate these issues immediately... The language says, as a cost savings measure, they're, they're going to say there's no liability from anybody, not the government, any past licensees, in a future past or present. It's, the language is unconscionable. But in my view, that needs to be struck down because the people in St. Louis were not informed for 20 years that they had this waste in their backyard. And the deception that has gone on it, many communities that have had this at least had the forewarning of knowing it was coming and it was there. Like in New Mexico, the community resisted. They didn't want the whip processing plant put in their backyard. The government said, take our $32 million or don't, but we're putting it in. So they accepted the money and they put it in. They knew there was catastrophic risk and people did die. Whereas, But in my view, St. Louis... It was a social science experiment, and it continues to be, with complete disregard. They, your community was not told for 20 years no. that this waste was there. And it was quietly shuffled in, just as this dump was sold quietly to somebody else. Like, you know, the AEC lied to unload all this, inf all this horrible waste on a private industry. And they have summarily refused to be responsible partners 100% of the time, it appears. Well, and, you know, I think you put it, you hit the nail right on the head. We, we didn't know. St. Louis, this was, a, this was top secret. This was kept from the people. You know, when, when you buy a home in St. Louis and, and maybe other places in the country, you know, for instance, if my home would have had lead paint and they'd have known that, they'd have had to disclose that when I purchased this home. And yet you can buy. You, I mean, I was allowed to buy within two miles of a Superfund site with the world's oldest radioactive waste, and nobody had to tell me. When I moved in, and I've been here almost 11 years, I had no idea even what a Superfund site was. I couldn't have looked it up if I wanted to because I simply didn't even know what it was. I, you know, I didn't know we were even moving next to a landfill because it's not visible from where we live. It's, you know, it's hard to explain, but it's like on the outskirts, and you drive past it, and you really honestly don't even hardly know. I mean, you do now because there's so much going on there, but, you know, even the radiation signs on the fence were rusted and had fallen off in places, so you wouldn't have even known there was radioactive waste there. I mean, I went past it many times, and because it was closed, again, I didn't know it was even a landfill. We didn't even know what it was. Oh. And I think that, you know, there are other sites, again, in this nation that this is happening in, though not as complicated as Lost Lake, but a lot of those people knew. They knew what they were living next to. Maybe some didn't. But th this, wasn't, this wasn't anything that anybody knew in St. Louis. And I'll tell you, I could go down my street right now go down my street and knock on a door and there's somebody that's like what radioactive waste what landfill wow and it's like you smell that and they're like well yeah but i thought that was the st louis and it's like well no that's a landfill on fire i mean 
it still is such a great kept secret and partially because, I mean, you know, nobody wants to let the cat out of the bag because they're worried economically about what it would mean for St. Louis. Well, you know, in my view, that this we are being economically challenged on all fronts, but in my view, we're, our government is sending money to Saudi Arabia. You know what right. I mean? Like, that, that, where are our values? I mean, we have a, a whole city that really needs to be systematically, like, we can start evacuating from the landfill out. The city needs to be evacuated because it's evidently a catastrophic Superfund disaster site. That's what it seems to me. I mean, and I know that sounds, you know, like this is just like you said, you know, we're radical, liberal person. That, you know, they're going to think that I'm some kind of a, a liberal activist fear-mongering. But that, you know, if we were to look at the medical costs of what is happening to the people in St. Louis... And the, just the families, the people that you don't move to a city and expose your future children to genetic. We know for a fact for every two rads of radiation in the air, we get for two, a population of 200 million people, we get 32,000 extra cancers and leukemias and 225 genetic mutations. We know that. That's scientific proof. We've known it since the late 50s. Right. So... Well... And, you know, that's something, too, you know, the number you spouted off, I looked that up last night, and yes, and, and, and that surprised me because, you know, we really are just moms, like you said. We came into this thinking, what the heck is that horrible smell going on in our neighborhood and calling about it after, you know, being inundated with it over and over and over and over again, and then it led us, frankly, down a rabbit hole that we are now. You know, this is not, you know, as I told you in the phone, this is not what this is not what Karen and I wanted to be when we grew up. You know, I understand that people are calling us activists and whatnot, and that word used to be like a slap in the face to me, and now, obviously, it, I, it means nothing except, you know, I, we didn't choose it. It, it fell yeah, in our lap. Too. We happened to be living in an area where this problem occurred and, frankly, was occurring for years, and we just didn't know about it. And we were not the type of people... It's very important. We're not the type of people with our heads in the sand. Like, uh, my brother is a doctorate in history. We grew up in St. Louis, and, you know, this is not, our role in the Manhattan Project is not discussed enough. It's not enough in history books. We don't discuss it during history here in St. Louis at all. Yeah. You know, we do talk about the Manhattan Project in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II, but no one ever points out the window and goes, oh, yeah, by the way, eight miles from here is where the first uranium for the bombs was processed. Yeah, and it it's was been how, illegally you know? dumped, and it's been illegally dumped, and the government is uh, summarily pretending that it's no big deal. That's the So let me, we have 15 minutes left, and I really want to get to two things, and I don't know if we have enough time, but one what are they proposing to do? Like, is there anything in a nutshell that really saying, like, okay, we know what we have to do, or they're just taking tests at this point? You know, honestly, they know they need to do something, but to date we have nothing that we can stand on for them to do. They, they haven't come up with anything to do, and it's very, I mean, it's beyond frustrating because you do have a time limit. It is a ticking clock here with this fire or with another one possibly starting, you know, we know that this waste can be dug up. We know that that can happen and it can be removed. It can be stored on site. It can be moved in rail cars. I mean, where the other waste is currently being railed out from North County. I mean, there's, there's different possibilities. The problem is this, and, and I think you know this from, from what you've been, you know, dealing with and what you've read. We're coming up against a wall where they say there is no immediate health threat, and that is the absolute term they use. There's no immediate health threat. Well, we all know <coughs> that exposure to, to, to chronic low-level ionizing radiation is not an immediate, you know, it takes, it takes, there's a latency period. It takes years sometimes for cancer to develop depending on how much you're exposed to, and um, Unfortunately, the public and basically a lot of our people are saying, well, look, they say there's no health threat. And I'm like, look, that's not what they're saying. 
they're saying there's no immediate health threat. Well, and then the other part of that language that they like to use, no immediate health threat, is actually not true. There is an immediate health threat because people get chronic rashes. They mm -hmm. get their eyes bleeding, their ears are bleeding, their nose bleeds, they get rashes. They're prone to diabetes. So there is an immediate health risk that does pop up. We don't get immediate cancer, but we do have immediate health risks. Right. And, you know, those are very – That's I'm very glad that you brought that up because it's important for the listeners to know that obviously we have radioactive waste in this landfill, but if we didn't, we still have a super fun site on fire putting horrible things into our community. And – what we're being told, and here is, this is the frustrating thing about science and these agencies. We're being told that, you know, there is no acute health risk because there is nothing, there is no one thing coming out of this landfill that is at a level to be considered acute. But there are hundreds of chemicals, in fact, they've identified two new chemicals that they've never seen before, probably from the combination of everything and the fire and the heat, um, th so it's like it's like we're getting a cocktail. If you think of it, and I hate to put it this way, it's like taking an empty glass and walking up to a bar and taking just a little bit of every liquor, not enough to be a shot, not enough to be acute for them to actually say, oh, my gosh, evacuate, there's a level of benzene that's acute. Nothing like that. But just a little bit of every liquor and pouring it in that glass, you would be left with one heck of a cocktail yeah. and it's one thing for a human to drink it and for an adult but think about putting that in a baby bottle and giving it to a six month year old Look, not even you know? a baby bottle you know uh Linus pauling did conclusive studies that babies in utero the fetuses i mean i don't get these so-called pro-lifers the people that are anti-choice people they are not even jumping up and down children that are exposed to levels of radiation that you guys are exposed to in St. Louis causes genetic birth defects. It is a known fact. Babies in utero are thousands of times much more sensitive to radioactive damage than right. anybody else. I mean, this is just, this is an unconscionable gross negligence that frankly not only is immature, but it needs to stop. I mean, I don't consider myself an activist, frankly. I consider myself an American. This is my duty as an American to speak out against this and demand some accountability from our government. I mean, it's our tax dollars that are doing this. When we're talking about the billions of dollars, it's our tax dollars. And I believe in paying taxes and b helping build our country, but part of that is, is we have to be responsible adults. And, and, you know, it may be hard. You know, there's a phrase I used to tell my kids, responsibility looks forward, blame looks backwards. So I get this, that we can't go be beating up everybody else looking back at what did happen, what had happened. But I really believe that we really need to put the line in the sand right now and say, okay, St. Louis is a catastrophe that is ongoing. And frankly, with this fire, this is an unknown. We do not know what's going to happen when that radioactive waste gets to the fire. Well, we don't. And, you know, we do know what happens when fire meets radioactive waste. Like, again, say a, say a glove that's contaminated with radioactive waste or clothing, you know, or anything from a hospital that's medically, you know, with, with chemotherapy drugs and stuff like that. We know what happens when you heat that up and that those particles leave. We know that. Yeah. But what we don't know is how far do they go, what the wind direction is going to be that day. I mean, that is the sort of thing how high will they be launched? Will they go out the flares, which are high up, which would, you know, give it more of a springboard, so to speak? Those are the things that we don't know because we can never, even in the lab, duplicate what's happening under the ground at this landfill. You know, the one thing I want to touch on that, that I think you, that you brought up a little bit is, you know, the whole American side of this and the whole patriotic. You know, this was part of the war effort. This was a top-secret thing in St. Louis that was done. I have the original contract between Malincrot and the federal government, you know, in the 1940s. It was top secret. They did this. They created this waste in an effort to beat Hitler in making the atomic bomb. And I won't go into whether that's right or wrong, but I will say this. You know, the workers at Malincrot, the workers that worked on this were subjected. This was brand new, dawn of the atomic age, um, 
Many of them got sick. Many of them died. At the end, they all got a pin and recognition from their federal government. I mean, they were heralded as heroes. And, you know, this waste, again, from World War II, is sitting right now in some people's backyards and in parks and up at a landfill. I mean, it's in ditches. It's sprinkled all over St. Louis, went out chimneys and smokestacks. The people that were exposed to this and that are ill from this, they are veterans. The people who have died, they are veterans of World War II. And to make it a step further and worse, these people are dying and getting sick from friendly fire. They're being, I mean, it is, it is patriotic at this point to clean this waste up. That, I mean, that is what needs to happen. You have people living in coffins, you know, who've died and are in coffins all over St. Louis. This is who should have had a, a burial and military honors at their funeral. You know, Don, this is the issue with the nuclear waste. There's no cleaning it up. This is why we need to demand evacuations. They know there's no cleaning it up. They have stepped into something scientifically that they have no answers for. This is why they keep building new nuclear power plants instead of addressing what to do with the waste. The only known thing they know what to do with the waste is to build nuclear weapons. So they and you know they say, well, we've got, you know, we've got uh, the friendly atom and we've got medical. The amount of met the isotopes that you need for medicine. You know, the, we don't need any of this, but the whole point is that they really have no way to clean up the waste. That's They're kicking the can down the road. That's what they're doing is they're just bumping it here, bumping it there. But in the meantime, we have families getting sick. This is a catastrophe that we are not addressing. And frankly, with the fire eminently on the back door of this lamp, you know, right next to it, the fire puts it, if there was no fire, probably, I mean, it is a cat, catastrophe for you to be living there, but the, what are they going to do when it catches fire? I mean, what's going to be their answer? We don't know, and you know, it's very frustrating for us because we, and that same phrase is echoed to us over and over. We don't know. This is very complicated. This has never happened before. And, you know, we keep going back to the same response, which is, okay, well, then move the people. If you don't know how to fix the site, then move the people and get them out of the way so that they're not being harmed and then figure out what you're going to do. It's a very complicated situation. You know, unfortunately, I mean, you are looking at a bunch of moms here who are trying to fight these big corporations and the federal government. I mean, that is literally what this is. We cannot outspend them. There's right. no way we can outspend them. We can't out litigate them. And what you know? what, what are the when, when we when you make these demands to the federal government like we want to be moved out? What do they say? What are they are they re, is there any movement like in at Roy Blunt's office or Claire McCaskill's office or your uh, your Congress people that are in that area? Are they making any? Is there any legislation proposed to move you out and to remediate you and buy those homes? Not right now. Basically, they are working and they are trying to negotiate with the company to do something for these people. It, it's really, they're putting it in the company's hands, in Republic Services' hands. And Republic has stated that they will never agree to move these people out. I mean, this is, again, the, the, you're, you're, talking, you're, wow. you're talking a drop in the bucket for this company to do this. It's, and this is not a company for the listeners that are list, hearing this. This is not a company that's hurting by any means. They have already reported to their shareholders that it might cost them up to half a billion dollars at this site, and it hasn't affected their shares. So before people say, oh, no, let's not bankrupt the company, you couldn't do that with this situation. And then they're splitting it 50 – well, actually, they're only paying one-fourth because Exelon pays a fourth, they'll pay a fourth, and the federal government will do 50%. So, you know, that, again, it it is – it so they the don't right even want to pay one quarter of the cost to move people out. No. They would rather start a coalition group. They are, for, for the listeners, our state is the only state in the nation that doesn't have campaign finance reform. We, we have unlimited campaign donations from, um, from these industries. Mm. Republic could write a billion-dollar check tomorrow and pay off all of our politicians, and that's what they're doing with our state reps. They're turning – they're starting – they're starting from the ground up with mayors and state reps, wow. getting them on board, and then they're slowly waking, making their way to, to, the, to the federal level. I mean, this is what this community is up against. 
Wow. We are literally a bunch of moms. And unfortunately, because of what we've been exposed to, many of the people in this group who are helping out, we are a bunch of moms with an expiration date. Wow. You know, we are losing our own people who are spending time fighting this, have their own cancer battles and wow. their autoimmune illnesses that they're fighting. And, you know, so our options are limited. You know, all we can do is... So like what, what, would you like our, what would you like our listeners to do? People that want to help and maybe move this thing forward, like what's, what would be a good action for them to take? What do you think would work? Well, you know, what we really need them to do, besides obviously please come over and join the Facebook page and introduce yourself. It's great to know that there are other people out there that care about us. It's that called is the Westlake Landfill. The Facebook right, Westlake Landfill, you know. Um, there's also Just Mom's STL Facebook page. But we have a list of things that we're working on right now. We're going to eventually have to go to Washington and testify for this bill. You know, we need to, and I get the liability issue in the bill, the wording, that's uncomfortable and upsetting. But right now, we have to get this away from the Environmental Protection Agency and away from this company. We've got to get this over to the Army Corps of Engineers, okay. their food threat program, because they are the experts at cleaning up this waste. They are five miles from us cleaning it up all along the creek in their downtown. They're all over St. Louis right now cleaning up. We are the only site that isn't currently being cleaned up or remediated because we're under the Environmental Protection oh my Agency. Gosh. Which gives, which again, gives these corporations, one being the nuclear industry, X1, one being Republic and the other, the federal government, gives them more uh, control over the site and the ability to negotiate. Okay, well look, we have 30 seconds left on. I really... Thank you for being part of the radio show. I look forward from somebody from your St. Louis community joining us, if not yourself, next Monday. I really am committed to talking about this every single week. I really appreciate your efforts, and thank you for being a, an upstanding and, and loving your children enough to speak out. And uh, like I say, put your courage feet on. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you, Lonnie. Bye-bye.